It's May 18th, and this is another of the interviews we're doing today about the release of the International Energy Agency's uh, uh, Pathway to Net Zero in 2050 report. It's uh, causing quite a, a stir uh, in uh, global circles, and we're going to be talking to Dr. Akshat Rathi, who's a climate and energy journalist for Bloomberg. So welcome to the interview, Akshat. Good to be here. Now, you wrote a column today about the politics of this report, and the Ener International Energy Agency is known for being very conservative uh, in its uh, forecasts and little leaning, skewing to the fossil fuel uh, sector. But this scenario report uh, is seen as a significant departure for the IEA, as I understand it. So the IEA, if we just look at the roots of the organization, speak to how it uh, operates. And it was created at a time of the oil crisis. And the mandate it was given was to ensure uh, stability of energy markets, mainly oil. Um, and then as uh, the years went by, it's only in the late 2000s or early 2000s that the IEA started thinking about the impact climate legislation is going to have on energy. Uh, and since then it's ramped up its modeling of the energy system to include clean energy, uh, but also to include uh, UN goals. Uh, initially that was uh, the sustainable development goals and then later on the Paris climate goals. And now most recently, as you said, uh, in net zero, 20, net zero by 2050, because that is the goal for re keeping warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, and every time we have seen, uh, as the IEA takes on a more ambitious climate um, target, that its clean energy uh, projections become more and more uh, ambitious. And that's just, a, 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 to some extent, just a, a matter of emissions having to uh, decline with clean energy, and that's what you need, uh, but also uh, that governments are setting these goals and the IEA is, after all, an intergovernmental organization, and so it responds to what governments are setting. So uh, can we understand the International Energy Agency as lagging governments in terms of its amb amb ambitions as the government set the targets, the IEA comes along and does the modeling and, and describes the pathway to achieve those? Or is there any sense in which the, the IEA is out in front of those governments? At least in the case of 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, that the IEA has lagged governments um, because for many years, after the Paris Agreement was signed, which had both goals. It had the goal of, uh, you know, well below two degrees Celsius, which the IEA produced a scenario for very quickly, uh, but also uh, a goal to try and keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which the IEA did not produce scenarios for. And so there was a demand from environmentalists, from investors uh, for the scenario. But uh, the IEA uh, said it is not something that the governments that are its members, which are the OECD countries, essentially the rich countries in the world, uh, demanded the IEA do. But that has changed in the last 18 months as government after government has uh, set a goal to become net zero within decades, typically by 2050. Now, in your column, you quoted a, a think tank analyst as saying, this isn't a modeling result, it's a call to action. So given the fact that we're going to be having COP26 in the fall, and we have a new uh, administration in Washington that's much more ambitious on this front, are we likely to see you know, a ramp up of climate ambitions over and above what we've got now? So one of the reasons that IEA is... Um producing these models is because it wants to give substance to the debate around net zero. Now we know net zero as sort of a destination to reach uh, in decades to come, but to reach there, you have to start the journey now. And what the IEA has done through this modeling is to lay out very clear milestones that countries will have to reach in 2021, this year, or 25 or 30 or 35 or 40 uh, as it gets to net zero. And that will play an important role in the debates that happen going into COP26 later this year. 
Now, you make the point again in your column that now that this report is out, that we'll see uh, countries, uh, governments uh, going back and their analysts saying, okay, uh, here's the pathway. Now, what do we have to do? What policy uh, uh, do we need to put in place uh, for, uh, so that our economies can, uh, can be consistent with that pathway to net zero in, 250, uh, in 2050? And so uh, I would assume that in the short term, we're talking about the OECD, uh, OECD governments that will be leading that charge. Yeah, and so one thing to understand again from the IEA perspective and why these models have so much influence and why we are talking about them is that um, it's not that other people don't produce modeling exercises. They do. Many people do, private organizations do, even bodies like the IPCC, which is a scientific body, produces modeling exercises. But very few organizations either produce them in the depth that the IEA produces them and provides those tools for others to replicate or fit their uh, data into, or uh, produces it as an organization that is uh, seen as a dip diplomatic channel through which energy policy and maybe climate policy can be set. So the IEA, when it sets up these um, uh, modeling exercises also works with certain governments and they don't just have to be the rich country governments, but even uh, its associate members, which essentially have some of the largest emitters. So Indonesia and India and China, um, and that kind of influence is not something that um, very many organizations have on country specific energy and climate policy. Um, and we'll certainly see the IEA use this uh, modeling exercise, which is going to now include in every annual report uh, to these uh, and take these to the debates and, uh, and influence the policies that are set. So is it fair to say then, Akshat, that I can, I can infer from what you're saying that the, uh, the IEA through its membership becomes almost like an informal influencer of these countries policies and ambitions and analyses and so on ahead of the more formal gatherings at the G7 or the COP, the COP meetings. Yeah, and we they provide essentially the data framework for you for countries to be able to make the informed decisions that they do have to make for policies. Uh, now, the, the specific report we are talking about today is a global analysis. Uh, so that will then have to be applied to a country level um, uh, a program depending on which countries want to take it on. Um, and we will see, I think, uh, big announcements coming in the G7 and G20 later this year before the COP meeting. Um, and there is no doubt that the IEA's uh, headline grabbing uh, point that said for this net zero by 2050 goal, there needs to be no new fossil fuel. Uh, development. Uh, and that will just be a talking point for leaders around the world. Uh, yeah, let's conclude our interview with that with that point. Uh, that was a real eye opener, I have to say, because um, at Energy Media, we uh, we uh, report about oil and gas, uh, not so much coal, but certainly oil and gas. And there's an expectation in many of the producing countries that oil is going to continue on for some time before it hits peak oil demand and begins to climb, and that gas will be a long-term uh, energy transition bridge. But the IEA seems to have put all of that in question. Yes, um, this is the challenge with 1.5 degrees Celsius. It is the most ambitious climate goal that we've agreed under a global framework and the room uh, in the atmosphere to hold greenhouse gases shrinks the more ambitious your climate goal is. Um, and this IEA exercise shows that if you take that climate goal seriously, uh, there is no more room for new fossil fuel development. Um, and any country or company making a plan that has more fossil fuel development in its uh, criteria is essentially not aligning with a 1.5 degrees Celsius world and presumably has to take the political consequences that come along with that. Well, Aksha, thank you very much for this. Always appreciate your insights. Thanks for having me.